Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pusanet Excel International Elevator Biology Unit 1 for January 2019. This is the part 2 video. I will put the link to the part 1 video below in the description box. Let us begin. Question 5. Liposomes are spherical structures composed of phospholipids. They can be made by adding phospholipids to water. Liposomes can be used to study membrane permeability. The diagram shows a liposome. So this is a liposome. They say calculate the volume of this liposome using the formula. Volume is equal to 4 over 3 pi r cubed. So if this is a diameter, it means the radius is going to be 50. So this is going to be 4 over 3 times pi times the radius cubed, which is 50 times 50 times 50. And this gives me 523598.7756, which is rounded off to 5235. 99 nanometers cubed and therefore that should be my answer here the next question says explain the arrangement of phospholipids in liposomes they want us to talk about this arrangement forming a bilayer so i said phospholipids contain hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails if i go back here when you look at this structure there are hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails so they are arranged in a way that the heads that are hydrophilic face towards the aqueous layer inside as well as the outside. So here I said, phospholipids contain hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails. In the liposomes, the hydrophobic tails move away from the aqueous layer while the hydrophilic heads align themselves towards the aqueous layer. And this results in an arrangement of phospholipids in a circular bilayer called a liposome. Moving on. Here they say the presence of cholesterol in the membrane affects membrane permeability. A student investigated the effects of cholesterol on the permeability of liposomes to glycerol at different temperatures. Liposomes were made by replacing 20% and 50% of phospholipids with cholesterol. Liposomes without cholesterol were also made. The graph shows the result of this investigation. So the graph shows permeability of the membrane to glycerol as temperature increases. We can see from the results as temperature increases, there is an increase in permeability at all percentages of cholesterol. However, the higher the concentration of cholesterol, the lower the permeability of the membrane to glycerol. We can see no cholesterol had the greatest permeability and the higher cholesterol concentration had the lowest permeability. So down here they say, how does glycerol pass through the liposome membrane? Glycerol will pass through by diffusion it's not going to be osmosis because this is for water, not for endocytosis, and not for active transport. It is going to be by diffusion. Moving on. Here they say, describe the effects of cholesterol and temperature on membrane permeability as shown in the graph. If I take you back to the graph, like I said already, the higher the concentration of cholesterol, the lower the membrane permeability, and the higher the temperature, the higher the membrane permeability at all concentrations of cholesterol. So here I said, increase in cholesterol decreases permeability of the membrane. Increase in temperature increases the permeability of the membrane. Cholesterol has a greater effect on membrane permeability at higher temperatures. When you look at this, when the temperature increases, we see the curve tends to move a little bit sharper. So we can say cholesterol has greater effect on membrane permeability at higher temperatures. Here they say, explain why cholesterol and temperature affect membrane permeability. Here I said, increase in temperature leads to an increase in the movement of phospholipids in the bilayer of the membrane, hence greater permeability. You guys know a higher temperature creates greater kinetic energy, so these phospholipids are going to be moving. Also, increasing the amount of cholesterol in the membrane reduces the membrane fluidity, hence a decrease in its permeability. So this brings us to the end of question 5. Let's continue to question 6. Question 6. Platelets are involved in the blood clotting process. The table shows the phospholipid content of the membranes of platelets. So we see the phospholipid contents, they've given us all that. We see the percentage of total membrane phospholipids and the percentage distribution of phospholipids in the membrane. I'm going to go down here. They say when platelets trigger the blood clotting process, more phosphatidylserine molecules move into the outer layer of the membrane. They want you to estimate the ratio of phosphatidylserine in the inner layer to that in the outer layer before the blood clotting process is triggered. 
if this is the scale we can see on this side, this number here is in between here. So this is going to be a 90 and this is in between here, which is going to be a 10. So we can say in the inner layer, we have 90, while in the outer layer, it's going to be 10. So the ratio is going to be 9 to 1. And that is going to be our answer here. Moving on. Here they say, describe the effects that the movement of phosphatidylserine into the outer layer will have on the content of phospholipids in the membranes of platelets. Here I say it, it will have no effect on the overall content of the phospholipids in the membrane of the platelets. However, the inner layer of the bilayer will have a higher phospholipid content, while the outer layer will have a lower phospholipid content. If you look at the information given previously, you can be able to observe that. The next part says describe how the movement of phosphatidylserine into the outer layer results in the production of thrombin in the blood clotting process. We know that phosphatidylserine will have to alter the platelet membrane properties, meaning fluidity is going to be altered and this will cause the platelets to release the enzyme thromboplastin. We know that thromboplastin catalyzes the conversion of prothrombin, an inactive enzyme, into the active form which is thrombin. And thrombin is an enzyme that is going to catalyze the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin, thus aiding the blood clotting process. Moving on. Here they say, thrombin inhibitors are drugs that have an effect on the time taken for blood to clot. Explain why thrombin inhibitors affect the time taken for blood to clot. Again, we remember that thrombin is there to convert fibrinogen into fibrin, and if there are thrombin inhibitors, it means the amount of fibrinogen that is going to be converted to fibrin is going to be decreased. So I said, thrombin is an enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin, and remember fibrin is the mesh like fiber that traps blood cells to form a clot. When thrombin inhibitors are present, they can change the shape of the active site of the enzyme, thrombin, so that it cannot bind to fibrinogen to convert it to fibrin. Therefore, less fibrin will be produced to trap blood cells during clot formation, and the time it takes to form a clot will be increased. So it means it will take longer for the clot to be formed because there will be less fibrin to trap the blood cells during the clotting process. So this brings us to the end of question six. Let's continue to question seven. Question seven, some insects lay eggs inside leaves this causes the leaves to produce swellings called galls. The galls supply the developing insects with nutrients and protect them from the external environment. The photograph shows galls on a leaf. These are the galls, you can see them. So down here they say, in an investigation, the concentration of protein molecules and amino acids found in healthy leaves, leaves with galls, and in the galls themselves were determined. The insects were removed from each gall before the investigation, suggests why the insects were removed from the galls. This is an experiment which should be carried out on the gulls and other insects, so the insects should be removed. One is to prevent the increase in the amino acid content, and the second one is to prevent the killing of the insects, and that would be unethical. Moving on. Here they say the amino acids were extracted and dissolved in a nonpolar organic solvent. The diagram shows the R group of the amino acids, alanine, aspartate, and tryptophan. Which row of the table describes the solubility of these amino acids in the nonpolar organic solvent. The most soluble is going to be alanine, and since this is a nonpolar solvent, aspartame being charged will not be soluble, and therefore it will have the least solubility. So the answer here should be a B. Moving on. Here they say the solubility of an amino acid can be determined by measuring the maximum mass of amino acid that dissolves in the known volume of solvent. The solubility of the amino acid histidine in a solvent is 43.5 gram per decimeter cubed. The mass of the amino acid leucine that dissolves in 250 centimeters cubed of the same solvent is 5.5. They want us to calculate how many times more soluble histidine is than leucine. I began by doing some calculations. If the solubility of histidine is 43.5 gram per decimeter cubed, and we know one decimeter cubed is 1,000 centimeters cubed, so 43.5 should be dissolved in 1,000 centimeters cubed. Also for leucine, if it's 5.5 grams in 250 centimeters cubed, I wanted to convert this into 1,000, so we multiply that by 4. But when we multiply the denominator by 4, we have to multiply that by 4 as well. So this should be 5.5 times 4 divided by 250 times 4, which gives us 22 divided by 1,000. So it means for this one here, we dissolve 43.5, while here we dissolve 22. And therefore, 
they should be 43.5 divided by the 22, which gives us 1.977. So it's 1.98 times more soluble than this in. Moving on. Here they say the gall forming insects secrete saliva into the plant tissues. The saliva contains enzymes that change the nutrient in the leaf and cause the galls to form. The graph shows the concentrations of protein molecules and amino acid molecules in tissues from a healthy leaf, tissues from a leaf with galls, and in the galls themselves. We have concentration of proteins on the vertical axis and we have the different components. So here we can see there is a greater concentration in the galls themselves. The next graph shows us the concentration of amino acids. Here we have the healthy leaf, leaf with galls, and the galls themselves. Then down here they say, the table shows the abundance of five amino acid molecules. So they've given us for alanine, arginine, histidine, leucine, as well as tryptophan. This is corresponding to how much they are abundant. The plus plus is the most abundant, and the minus is going to be absent. Moving on. Here they say, explain the results of this investigation and use the information in both graphs and the table to support your answer. So I began by looking at the results. So based on the results, there is a high concentration of protein in the gulls. And this is evident. We saw here. When we look at this graph, we can see there is a higher concentration of proteins in the gulls. Here, there is a higher concentration of amino acids in the gulls. And when we come down here, we can see alanine is going to be the most abundant, at least in all. And then this is going to be absent in all of them. So here I said, Based on the results, there is a high concentration of protein in the gulls compared to the leaves. The enzymes secreted by the gull forming insects stimulate protein synthesis so that more proteins are stored in the gulls as nutrients for the growing insects. Remember, this question is asking us to explain. So whichever observation we see, we have to be able to explain it. And then here I say there is a high concentration of amino acids in the gulls. This is from the second graph. The amino acids are more in number than the proteins. So this is because the enzymes were breaking down plant protein into amino acids to be used to synthesize proteins required by the insects. And down here I said, among the amino acids, alanine, arginine, and histidine are found in high concentration in the gulls, and none of these amino acids are abundant in the leaf tissues of the leaves with gulls. It is because they have moved into the gulls. We also see that leucine and tryptophan are not abundant in the gulls because they have been used by the insects. So this brings us to the end of question 7. Let's continue to question 8. Question 8. The photograph shows two mammals, an elephant and a mouse. We can see this is the elephant and that is the mouse. Here they say the height of the mouse is 3 centimeters. They wanted to calculate how many times taller the elephant is than a mouse. And they wanted to use the white line drawn on the photograph of the elephant to calculate this value. So magnification is equal to image size divided by the actual size. If the magnification is 0 0.02 and the image size is 4.5, we can be able to find the object size, which is X. And that gave me 225. So the actual size of the elephant is 225 centimeters. Now, if the mouse is 3 centimeters, it means 225 divided by 3 gives us 75 times. So the elephant is 75 times taller than the mouse. Moving on. Here they say the respiratory system of an elephant is different from that of other mammals. The lungs are attached to the chest cavity wall and the diaphragm by collagen fibers. Describe how the lungs of an elephant are adapted for gaseous exchange. So we can see that attaching the lungs to the chest cavity wall increases the volume of the thoracic cavity and it will decrease the pressure greatly during inhalation. They have alveoli to provide a large surface area for the diffusion of gases. The lining of the alveoli, which is the epithelial layer, is going to be one cell thick to minimize the distance the substances have to move during the effusion. And then blood flow around the alveoli enables the concentration gradient to be maintained so efficient gas exchange occurs. Here we are looking at fixed law of diffusion, which talks about a good concentration gradient, a larger surface area to volume ratio, and a smaller diffusion distance in order to achieve greatest gaseous exchange. Moving on, here they say graph 1 shows the oxygen dissociation curve of hemoglobin for a mouse and for an elephant. We can see that of a mouse is to the right of that of the elephant, so it means the one for the elephant has a higher affinity for oxygen in comparison to the mouse at the same partial pressure. You can see if this is the partial pressure we use. Again, there is more oxygen within the elephant 
in comparison to the mouse. With graph 2, they say graph 2 shows the mass-specific metabolic rate for a mouse and for an elephant. The mass-specific metabolic rate is the measure of how much oxygen is needed for chemical reactions per gram of body tissue. So we can see for the mouse and then we can see for the elephant. So this explains the difference in oxygen dissociation curves of hemoglobin for the mouse and for the elephant and use the information in both graphs to support your answer. If I take you back a little, we can see the oxygen dissociation curve for the elephant was to the left. So the elephant hemoglobin has a high affinity for oxygen in comparison to the mouse hemoglobin at all partial pressures of oxygen. And here we saw that the elephant uses up less oxygen per kilogram in comparison to the mouse. So here I said, the mouse hemoglobin has lower affinity for oxygen than the elephant hemoglobin since the oxygen dissociation curve for the mouse has shifted to the right. This ensures that the mouse gets enough oxygen supply at lower partial pressures. I'm talking about the tissues within the mouse. They will be able to get enough oxygen supply at lower partial pressures of oxygen because the mouse has a higher rate of respiration. Based on the second graph, the mouse has a higher mass-specific metabolic rate than an elephant because it has a large surface area to volume ratio. This makes it lose more body heat. Also, mice move more frequently than elephants when they're escaping from predators, so their rate of respiration will therefore be higher than in elephants, leading to lower partial pressure of oxygen in the mouse tissues, resulting into mouse hemoglobin releasing oxygen when the blood cannot supply oxygen at a fast enough rate. So this brings us to the end of question 8 as well as the end to this paper. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.